Uh, the uh, introduction screen uh, is deliberately provocative. Uh, you see the first picture of a nuclear test um, and then the signature of the treaty uh, and then a question mark. Um, and I will let it there and make you think, what, why is that? We'll come back to that. So the very first nuclear test was conducted on the 16th of July. Um, it is interesting that today is the 14th of July. Um, so only two days from now, in 1945, the United States conducted the world's very first nuclear test. Um, the picture on the right, uh, top right, is uh, Dr. Robert Oppenheimer, uh, who was the lead scientist of the Manhattan Project, sitting next to the device. Um, and that is what it looked like. It was not a bomb. Um, it was an, a very large um, uh, plutonium-based um, very elementary nuclear weapon. The picture on the bottom uh, right is uh, the split second after the weapon det detonated, where you can see that it creates um, this, this ball, uh, and that's where the energy is in. And uh, of course, after that, the energy is released, the blast force is released, and the heat is released, and eventually also the radiation. I'm always struck by the quote from the Bhagavad Gita, the, the Hindu scripture, that came to mind uh, to Dr. Oppenheimer when he saw uh, that fireball. Uh, he was interviewed later, uh, and if you are interested, you can Google it. Um, and when he said these famous words, if the radiance of a thousand suns were to burst at once in the sky, that would be like the splendor of the mighty one. Now I have become death, the destroyer of the world. Um, the, the, in the Hindu scripture, it's the sort of a six armed um, monster, if you wish, um, that uh, has become, is, is the destroyer of the world. So very, very uh, pointed and striking quote. Over, over the time since 1945, uh, the world has seen a um, significant number of nuclear tests. When I was at the CTBTO, we used to call this the fever chart. And it shows the number of tests by the countries that are listed there. Um, these are all the nuclear weapon states, except, of course, Israel, who has never uh, tested, at least not uh, publicly admitting to it. And you see from 1945, um, uh, going all the way through uh, to the 2017 tests by uh, North Korea. Um, what is noticeable on this is, of course, in 1959, there were no tests. And the reason for that is that uh, the Soviet Union, the United States and the United Kingdom uh, issued moratoria on their test while they were trying to negotiate in Geneva a comprehensive test ban treaty. That failed, um, and we know what happened um, in 1962, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and you see that uh, the world saw in one year alone um, about just more than 140 nuclear tests. Uh, you can see, all, if, you, if you closely look at the dates, You'll also see, you know, when the Berlin Wall was erected, um, you know, the whole issue of detente. Um, there are lots of interesting historical linkages that you can make. So the, the message here is, is that nuclear testing is not only about testing of the actual uh, weapons and the designs, we'll come to that, but it's also sending political messaging. Another significant feature of this chart is that in 1996, um, the the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty was signed, and you'll see the curve flattens completely, uh, with the exception of India and Pakistan testing in '98, uh, and the six tests by North Korea. We have not seen any tests, uh, so that means that the CTBT, well, not in force yet. Um, is in fact um, working. In 
just to give you an indication um, on a different way of, of the new number of tests, so 247 nuclear explosions have been uh, conducted over time. Um, and that means one test every nine days for 50 years up to the time of the, in, the signature of the CTBT in 1996. So um, I think most of us, if I stand to be corrected, but most of, of you on this webinar, on this course, may have not experienced tests, except for the recent ones. Um, but there was a time, especially in the 60s and 70s, when there were many, many tests. And so the question that you have to ask yourself is, what, which is a more a safer environment to live in, uh, in an environment where there are no tests or where there are nine tests uh, one test every nine days of course it's it's the former um, and then one has to wonder uh, what goes on in the minds of people that are suggesting that uh, testing should resume nuclear testing is also linked directly to the nuclear arms race uh, so from the very beginning uh, these tests were designed to um, understand the the design the, and the power of nuclear weapon, but also to make them smaller. You can imagine that that big sphere that I showed earlier cannot be de delivered by aeroplane or by missile or any other means. Um, but over time, the weapons have been become smaller, that the designs have, have, in, have improved, uh, the yield has expanded, the, the, the power, of a nuclear explosion. Um, and so this chart is just a, a very small um, fraction of time showing from the very beginning, including the use of the two weapons in, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But when the nuclear weapon states entered uh, the nuclear weapons club, um, so 49 was the Soviet Union, 52 was the United Kingdom. Um, the United States detonated up until that point, uh, the largest nuclear explosion, uh, Nike, Mike, a 10.4 megaton explosion, bear in mind, uh, um, 1,000 kilograms of TNT is uh, one, uh, 1,000 tons of TNT is one um, kiloton. So a megaton is obviously a million. Um, the largest nuclear device ever exploded was the tar bomb uh, it was it, it was detonated at a yield of 57 megatons it was in fact designed as a 100 megaton weapon but it was dialed down uh, to be smaller incidentally apparently about concerns by those who designed it that it may actually uh, lead to massive destruction um, in, if not the atmosphere at least of of the area it was detonated in uh, France also joined in 1960, um, China in 1964, uh, India in 1974 uh, with the so-called Smiling Buddha test, which was um, first historically noted as a peaceful nuclear explosion. We'll come back to that. The smallest weapon ever designed was the little feller, Davy Crockett. It was a bazooka type weapon, and you'll see it in the bottom right screen of about 0.01 kilotons and it was designed as a battlefield weapon um, that you could launch it in the for to destroy say an incoming tank brigade uh, coming across um, eastern europe there's always the concern that that the soviet union could invade europe with massive numbers of tanks uh, i always find it interesting that the poor soldier that has to detonate this bazooka uh, would probably have will probably become a victim uh, himself since the range of that bazooka uh, was about two kilometers. Um, so uh, the, the chance for the soldier to survive the blast would have probably been limited. Um, just very briefly, these are the nuclear test environments. Um, so testing occurs uh, above ground. Um, typically, they are placed in a on a tower, like the first very one, very first one, Trinity, uh, or they are they, they are 
drilled they drill a tunnel or a deep borehole into the ground and place the device there or as North Korea has, has done I mean, several times drill uh, tunnels into mountains. Uh, they also detonate it in the atmosphere, um, so which obviously is very dangerous, as, uh, not only for the, the uh, radioactivity fallout, but also today would be for satellites. Um, and then underwater. Um, so when you look at ways to detect nuclear testing, and Dr. Graham will talk about that, uh, you need to be able to detect testing in all those uh, environments. Uh, just a brief map about where testing occurred, and you see most of the tests uh, by the Soviet Union occurred in uh, on the territory of what is today Russia, but also the territory of um, former Soviet states, uh, most notably Kazakhstan, um, and the current Soviet test um, range, which is still uh, active, although so Russia is no longer testing, is in a via Zimbla way up um, in, in the Arctic Circle. The United States have tested uh, uh, not only in the, what is what used to be called the Nevada test site, but in other parts of the continental US, but uh, also most notably in the Pacific Islands. Um, France tested in Africa and in the Pacific Islands, uh, the UK tested in the Pacific Islands and in Australia, uh, never tested, of course, on its own territory. Uh, and then um, China tested only on its own territory, and so did India, Pakistan, and of course, uh, North Korea. Testing motivations. It's, it's important to understand why countries test. Uh, and there are um, five principal motivations. Um, weapons to test the effect of the weapon, whether the weapons would be safe in terms of can they be delivered without exploding, um, whether they, what kind of, um, to, to make sure that the, the weapon perform the way that it should be, um, what are the political motivations I mentioned earlier, it, it's a very powerful way of sending signals to an adversary, and then also the concept of peaceful nuclear explosions. We'll briefly touch upon these. Firstly, weapons effects. So you can see um, the, the, the blast um, dome uh, on this particular test. And this was a test that was conducted uh, in the Pacific to, you see a lot of old battleships there to test the effect of a nuclear weapon on a, on a, uh, a fleet. Um, and to the right, the pictures that you see there was actually the Nevada test site. Uh, in, in the United States, um, the blast effect of a, of a weapon. Um, so this is measured in, in uh, PSI, um, pound per square inch. Uh, and so it's like the amount of pressure you put in a bicycle tire, for instance, but it obviously uh, spread over a, a much larger area. Uh, and it shows just simply the, the, uh, the pressure of the, of, the, of the blast, how it would destroy uh, a house. Um, so um, looking at some famous nuclear tests in the past, uh, the second and third nuclear test of, of the United States were obviously um, to test the effect of a nuclear bomb. And um, they famously det detonated in the Pacific, uh, the, and the, uh, the, uh, the Kini Atoll, um, the Baker test, a 21 kiloton test, um, to detect, uh, see if it, it would work. Uh, and so many of the others uh, in a similar way. Um, unfortunately, many of these tests uh, have gone wrong and we'll touch upon that. And well, also it's important to understand the mindset of the time. So the small picture in the middle of uh, the slide at the bottom shows uh, the admiral that was um, overseeing the test in the Pacific with his wife cutting a cake that looks like a, resembling a, a nuclear explosion. Um, they were very proud of their accomplishment uh, when these tests were conducted successfully. Um, safety tests, now this is always an interesting concept to understand and it's also important to understand the reason for testing um, and also why testing stopped because it was replaced with another mechanism 
to test the safety and uh, reliability of, of nuclear weapons uh, in the United States. That is called the Stockpile Stewardship Program. But in those days, uh, they actually tested nuclear weapons to see if they were safe, meaning um, whether they had a one-point safe system, it means that um, the, the, uh, the amount of explosives that, uh, that uh, would detonate at any single point uh, would produce uh, a, a yield. Um, and then whether the stimuli on the weapon, say for instance, if it's put on a missile, you can imagine the a massive amount of pressures uh, will um, not set off the nuclear device. And then what's called the uh, permissive action link, and that is a security device for nuclear weapons to prevent unauthorized um, arming or detonation. So um, while you may think, well, you know, uh, a nuclear weapon has such massive destructive power, why would they be considered about safety? Uh, it is amazing to, um, to read about all the accidents that have happened. Nuclear weapons actually were dropped accidentally, planes crashed, uh, so a nuclear weapon, um, even the older weapons, but definitely modern weapons, will not detonate upon impact alone. Uh, it will probably create um, a lot of dispersal of radioactive material, but there will be no detonation. It will have to be detonated um, by, by a, a remote device, or it must be armed first. And uh, so these are part of the reason that they tested. Um, then weapon development test. Um, the picture on the left is probably the most evil um, device, you know, if you can imagine. That's a, um, a MRF warhead. So it's multiple entry, uh, multiple uh, re-entry vehicle. Um, so what you see there are uh, nine warheads on uh, one on a, on a warhead, there's actually 10, there's, there's one not in there, and that was nine warheads that could be um, delivered on particular targets, and they can all be individually targeted to, say, different parts of a city or different cities. Um, so you can imagine to design warheads of that size to fit on one missile, you need to be able uh, to do performance testing. You also need to do physics testing. Um, so the bottom right is the is the uh, mock-up of the largest weapon ever tested, the Tsar bomb. You can see how massive that thing was. So that was all part of from the the smallest weapon to the largest weapon, and then the top right corner is the most modern weapon that is to be introduced in the U.S. arsenal. And um, this thing will be able to. You can decide whether you want a very small yield or a large yield. Um, and it will be carried, obviously, by smaller type aircraft. Performance testing, uh, a number of uh, significant tests were conducted, very large tests. Uh, this is the IV test, uh, mic test of 10.4 megatons. Just an example of, if you see the pictures in the bottom, um, that the original um, design was, you know, the size of a, of a very large, a refrigerator of cool hydrogen isotopes. Um, and that was then transformed into what was called the MK-17, which was one of the primary nuclear weapons in the US arsenal for, for many years. It has since been discontinued. Weaponizing. Um, so you want to make sure that if you launch your nuclear missile, in this case, a submarine, or a submarine launched ballistic missile, that um, the weapon will travel to where it is supposed to be detonated and that it will detonate. Um, because if you send a, a nuclear armed missile to your adversary, um, they know, as they say, they know what your address is. One will come back at you. So this is about nuclear deterrence, uh, nuclear strategy, uh, first and second strike capabilities. So you want to be absolutely sure that the weapon that you deliver will will detonate at that particular yield. And so this, this was a test uh, in 1962 where they uh, put a live warhead on a submarine-launched ballistic missile. 
they launched it in the Pacific and it was detonated and you can see the, the periscope picture was in fact taken from a submarine in the area of the explosion to verify that it uh, was uh, that it exploded and they also had means to detect the yield and other performance of that uh, device um, and uh, it traveled over a range of a thousand more than a thousand miles uh, detonated at 600 kilotons um, so very close to where it detonated was the island uh, is the island of Kiribati uh, today an independent country um, and you can see also the bottom right is the basically the US Naval Station um, that was uh, rigged to detect the, the tests. So uh, it was one of the only tests of a, of a live ballistic missile. Physics, um, I, I mean, I don't know if Dr. Graham is on, online, he can explain this much better than I, but um, the development of advanced designs would require further understanding of, of physics. Um, and so, the Soviets, for instance, uh, their first Soviet uh, thermonuclear device um, that was detonated in the mid 50s uh, was a two stage device. It was uh, resembling of more modern weapons, um, but it was actually, um, a, in fact, a one stage device. It was based on the Sloika model. Sloikas are these sort of uh, layered pastries. Um, and, um, it was sort of layered uh, fission um, as opposed to the, the, the more modern designs. Um, the nuclear weapons of today uh, basically look like the picture. We've had a discussion last week with Dr. Ferenc about nuclear designs, but it's really only important to understand the, um, the, the physics of, of, uh, of, a, of a nuclear device. Uh, that's why many tests are designed to to, this, to test the physics. So moving to peaceful nuclear explosions. Um, this is a very interesting concept and a very strange one. And I'm not gonna uh, stand still on this too long, um, but in fact, the NPT recognized, in fact, Clato Loco recognized uh, the potential benefits of a peaceful nuclear explosion. Uh, and uh, an article, five of the NPT it went as far to say that uh, those benefits must be shared with non-nuclear weapon states, not allowing non-nuclear weapon states to test these devices. But uh, if a device is tested or uh, if a country such as the United States has the ability, they must be willing to share that with non-nuclear weapon states. Now, the, the purpose of this was to move large quantities of earth, to, say for mining, uh, to put out uh, oil and gas fires or stimulate gas uh, exploration, to do uh, uh, seismic sounding. Maybe Dr. Graham can talk a little bit about that. Uh, the point here, however, is, is that it created um, very uh, significant problems. Um, so just a few few pictures here. Uh, so on the right is the sedan test. And, uh, the previous slide showed uh, a viewing platform. In fact, uh, the people standing there are uh, officials from the CTBTO visiting the Nevada test site at the time um, are looking at this is a very very large crater um, and still the it's the largest human-made crater uh, detonated by the sedan test uh, and you can imagine the amount of radioactive radioactive material that it dispersed into the atmosphere on the left uh, is uh, Shagan, Shagan Lake that is in Kazakhstan, but it was on the Soviet test site at the time. And um, they purposefully detonated to see if they can actually create a, a reservoir. Um, but you can imagine what that must have done to the underwater, um, the quality of the underwater uh, river that was punctured to create this lake. Um, and then some interesting uh, concepts that were luckily never executed, but were in the minds of the planners. So on, on the project chariot was an attempt to uh, create a deep uh, water harbor on the coast of Alaska by detonating five thermonuclear devices uh, to make a deep water harbor, both for export of, of uh, minerals 
but also uh, to supposedly create a deep water fishing harbor um, in the area. You can imagine what that have done to the fish. So the point was that the local community objected and that project was scrapped. A project that may sound like science fiction, especially given uh, that this is in Central America, uh, but it was not science fiction. This was very much in the planning uh, by the planners in the 60s is to create a panatomic canal, um, similar to the Panama Canal. Uh, this was conceived after the closure of the Suez Canal following the war between Israel and Egypt, and the fear that the Panama Canal that was just uh, open in those years uh, may, may face a similar fate someday. Uh, so there were ideas to blast the canal uh, through Costa Rica um, and also um, uh, through parts of, um, of uh, southern Panama. Uh, luckily, those ideas were scrapped, but just the concept of it was pretty frightening. Um, just uh, to get an indication of what the numbers are between the Soviet Union and the United States is the ones with the largest number of tests. And you can see the, the number, especially also peaceful nuclear tests, uh, is quite staggering. Political motivations. Uh, let me say a few words about that. Uh, first of all, uh, sends political messaging if you test. Um, and this was a very strong way of communicating between uh, the United States and the Soviet Union. Also political posturing. Uh, France, um, even up until today, uh, would, its nuclear posture is based on, on this. India very much so as well, to show to the world that they have this power. I would say nuclear blackmail in the case of North Korea uh, to extract um, certain um, advantages or in terms of you know, lifting of sanctions or, or uh, to to test, sends that message very clearly. Then there's security and strategies of nuclear coercion. And this is the whole point of nuclear deterrence. Um, uh, and also to make threats, um, to try and change the status quo, or compellence. Um, so uh, threatening to test a nuclear weapon um, and then perhaps testing it can be very, very powerful. In fact, that was very much the theory behind the South African nuclear program uh, way back. Then, um, obviously, if you make a threat, you need to test it. And so many of the first tests were, were, were announced. They didn't try to hide them. Um, and uh, that was very much a signal to the world. And then, uh, lastly, domestic politics. So there are obviously um, advantages to show domestically that you are an advanced country because now if you test you join the club of, of countries that have uh, nuclear weapons but also a national pride um, that would, would be created you may have seen if you look at some video footage of when India and Pakistan tested their nuclear weapons in 1998 uh, thousands of people were jubilating in the street uh, they were very proud of, of that accomplishment uh, but nuclear tests can also relieve domestic pressure. So if, um, and the reverse of that is true as well. Um, if nuclear weapons, and to some extent are even today considered to be the ultimate weapon, and therefore uh, it represents ultimate power. And so if you uh, test a weapon, you are seen to, to be a very strong leader. Uh, if you talk about no testing or giving up nuclear weapons, you're seen as a weak leader. I don't agree with those concepts, but that is, that is certainly uh, true in, in certain countries. Um, but the consequences of nuclear testing, what, when things go wrong. Um, so I, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I wanted to put, uh, highlight a few. Bainbury, for instance, is a nuclear test that was conducted at the Nevada test site. Uh, it was an underground test, uh, but unfortunately it vented. And uh, to the right, you see a map. Uh, that um, not only did the radioactivity go uh, from the United States, the prevailing winds are from west to east, but it in fact also went into California. Um, uh, and then on the picture on the right, uh, Buster, this was a nuclear test, deliberately detonated um, with the idea of having troops on the field um, in case you know, of the need to 
to fight nuclear uh, a, a battle in a, in a nuclear uh, scenario. Um, then two more examples, uh, John, the test in Nevada, these guys were volunteers and they were asked to stand below a test detonated uh, in the above, above ground and high atmosphere. Um, and you can see they, this one guy is wearing, a, it has a little poster, ground zero. And they were supposed to um, show that you know, nuclear weapons are not so bad. And then finally, uh, the very famous Castle Bravo test. This was the largest uh, nuclear uh, test conducted by the United States and apologized. It should not be 15 kilotons, it should be 15 megatons. Um, the test basically obliterated uh, parts of the Bikini Atoll. Uh, it was much larger than anticipated. Um, there was a miscalculation in the size. Uh, and so while the US Navy cleared the islands from fishing vessels uh, that were fishing there, since the device yielded a much larger um, explosion, um, the fishing vessels outside the original area were also effective, including a vessel called the Lucky Dragon 5, um, a Japanese fishing vessel. Um, and many of its, if not all its uh, crew members later died of radioactive. Um, some of the, the consequences are, are very tragic. So in the Marshall Islands, um, the Bikini Atoll, today the Marshall Islands of course an independent country, uh, but this is where many of the nuclear weapons tests were conducted. Um, the United States government uh, started to decontaminate the area in the, in the 70s, uh, incidentally they sent in um, the Army Corps of Engineers, um, uh, guys, and was a, you could sign up voluntarily to go to a Pacific Island, um, and there are pictures of people walking around bare feet with snow shirts on, picking up pieces of metal after the test. Um, and all of that uh, remnants of the testing were put into a very large pit uh, that was actually created by a test and covered with a concrete dome. Well, that concrete dome is leaking. And the Marshall Islands um, have been, over the years, are pushing hard to get compensation for this. Um, in 2018, there was, in fact, a study released that indicated that the radioactivity in parts of the islands is higher than at uh, Chernobyl. Um, and last year, the United States, in fact, admitted that it withheld information on the nuclear waste left uh, behind. And new negotiations between the Marshall Islands and the United States were supposed to start um, this year. Of course, there's an added problem. Uh, as the ocean temperatures rise, so does the water levels. Um, and you can see that that dome is uh, very close to, to the ocean level. And one can just imagine what will happen if it gets uh, flooded. Um, the downwind effect of testing is extremely important, and this is just in the United States. Uh, this occurred, of course, in all other parts, but it's interesting to note, uh, if you look at the map uh, with all the, the blue and red, and the, these are the counties of the United States, that uh, many of the counties downwind from the Nevada and other test sites were affected. Uh, even, and the map doesn't show it, but even as far as the top, as the northeast coast of the United States, very, very far from where counties were, uh, where, where testing occurred. Um, this resulted in um, a very famous uh, study by Dr. Lu Louise Rice, uh, where she studied um, the radioactivity found in baby tooth um, and found that the, the levels were extremely high. So basically, uh, kids born in the, in the late 50s and uh, 60s um, were all, um, some way or the other in the United States, affected by, by nuclear testing. Um, this, this is just an interesting graph showing uh, the radioactivity um, in places even in New Zealand, there's no nuclear activity, and Austria, also no nuclear activity in Austria, yet the radioactivity in the 60s were extremely high. Um, finally, I want to just point out this is a very interesting concept. So the, the US um, actually tested up in Alaska, and um, 
there was a group of activists uh, that wanted to block this test. Now, this is the Spartan missile test. Uh, then they went up there and they chartered a fishing boat uh, just to sail into the area to you know, protest. Uh, the fishing boat's name was Greenpeace. And of course, um, they were the US Navy uh, blocked them and there were obviously a, a lot of controversy about this. Uh, of course, Greenpeace became Greenpeace, the, the movement. Uh, Greenpeace is one of the most activist uh, movements, not only in terms of nuclear testing, but the environment and other, saving the whales, um, saving the ocean uh, as, as well. Um, uh, interesting twist to that, a later Greenpeace um, flagship of, of, of the movement uh, protested the French testing in the Pacific and was um, destroyed by French saboteurs. Uh, in the harbor of Wellington, New Zealand. Um, New Zealand took France to the World Court, and at the end, uh, it was admitted that um, these were deliberate attacks. So, interesting twist on, on, on history there. Uh, this just shows, it's an animation just showing what, if, if you were a Neanderthal person looking forward, uh, what would it look like if you consider that the half-life of plutonium-239 is 24 thousand years. So um, uh, the, the remnants of nuclear testing um, in certain parts of the world will be with us for, for a long time. Uh, of course, there are alternatives to full-scale testing. Um, I would mentioned earlier the stockpile stewardship program. So these are not tests as defined uh, as, uh, in terms of yield. They do not yield any explosion, um, but they are pretty controversial. Um, and so the different types of testing conducted in very large facilities, not only in the United States, but other parts, other nuclear weapon states, um, allow states to, to test the reliability of whether the weapon will actually work and the safety of these weapons, as opposed to actually live tests. Um, in Latin America and the Caribbean, in particular, uh, the, the community of CELAC, um, have taken quite an issue with, with these issues. And I recall from my days at the CTBTO that uh, the CELAC countries have consistently made statements that uh, these tests, uh, while um, not uh, live tests or yield resulting tests, are against the spirit of the CTBT. Uh, that controversy obviously continue. Also important is that uh, computer have, computers have become um, at least 100,000 times more powerful uh, and modern than, than what they used to be when nuclear weapons were designed. And so the question remains in the future as to what extent computers will be able to not only simulate tests based on past data from previous tests, but in fact actually uh, be able to design new types of weapons. Right, let me talk briefly about the CTBT negotiations. Uh, I don't want to go into too much history because I want to give time for, for Dr. Graham. Um, so uh, despite several attempts to negotiate a treaty in the, um, in the mid um, 70s and 80s and 90s, uh, the conference on the Salmon failed to do so. Uh, here I think the most notable uh, event was the 1990 uh, NPT review conference where Mexico, supported by the non-aligned, in particular the Latin American countries, refused to um, agree to an outcome document if the outcome document does not list the CTBT as a priority. Um, and interesting enough, at the 1995 conference, the CTBT was central in, in the NPT following the announcement by President Clinton in 93, or actually 92, that the United States is now ready to stop testing and uh, that it announced the stockpile stewardship program. Um, and so that led to the negotiations in the Conference of Disarmament, which President Clinton at the time described as the longest sought and hardest fought battle, the history of arms control. And I, and I, and I actually agree with that uh, even today. Interesting that uh, it was the kind of the right thing to do at the right time. It was the end of the Cold War. Uh, the United States and the Soviet Union, or Russia at the time, uh, announced moratoria. Um, there was a group of scientific experts that have been working for close to 20 years to design what is 
basically now called the International Monitoring System. And there was significant developments in science um, that uh, allowed um, for the establishment of a system that is capable of detecting nuclear tests. Very importantly was the rising influence of civil society and public opinion. Um, and then uh, something that is not always recognized, but is important to understand, and as young diplomats, this is really important for you to understand, is that the Chemical Weapons Convention took many years to negotiate, also in the Conference of Disarmament. So many of the ne negotiators, I mean, one comes to mind, but there were several from Latin America, uh, Ambassador Miguel Marin Marsh, um, were involved in um, those negotiations, were highly skilled, uh, and jumped into the negotiations of the CTBT. Um, and so if the reverse is actually true today, unfortunately, I believe, since the CD has not been able to negotiate for more than 20 years, I, th I don't think the uh, expertise is necessarily there anymore. Uh, it can be, but it's not at the moment. Um, some challenges, I'm not going to go into too much detail, simply to say that there were not uh, there was not agreement on many aspects, uh, including the entry into force. India, for instance, blocked agreement. India wanted a time-bound framework disarmament provision in the treaty, and there is no disarmament provisions in the CTBT. Um, and India basically uh, refused to, to agree to the consensus in the conference of disarmament. And therefore, there was actually no consensus. So the, to say that the treaty was fully negotiated in the CD is not technically correct. What happened is Australia, um, who uh, chaired the CD at the time, um, took the treaty and attached it to a General Assembly resolution, tabled it in New York, and the treaty was voted on by the General Assembly, passed with a very large majority, and opened the same day for signature. Um, basically, the main objectives of the treaty um, is to ban all nuclear testing, backed by a verification system. Uh, it must be transparent, and this is, I uh, may have said this earlier in a different lecture, um, this, the information that generated by it belongs to all the states. Um, it is not only the most powerful. And so if countries are in the Security Council without the means to detect um, for themselves whether North Korea de uh, detonated a nuclear device, this uh, information is, is available to them. Um, even in raw form, and, they, and Dr. Graham will talk about um, the training that these um, CTBTO provides to enable countries to um, analyze the data. It, it, it uh, helps to um, stem both vertical and horizontal proliferation. It is essential for deep, deep arms reduction. So there's no disarmament component to the treaty, but in an environment of nuclear tests, it is hardly imaginable that states would reduce nuclear weapons. Um, so it creates the environment. Um, it is the downstream barrier to nuclear weapon acquisition. So once you test, you've crossed that threshold, just like IA safeguards is the upstream legal requirement for states not to divert material for, um, for military purposes. And then, of course, uh, it works very closely with nuclear weapon free zones. Uh, it enhanced regional security. Um, I'm, the basic provision, of course, of the treaty is to uh, carry out not to carry out nuclear weapon test explosions or other nuclear explosions. Um, this is where peaceful nuclear explosions come in. Um, and to also not to, to assist in doing so. Uh, to create the organization in Vienna uh, and to ensure the treaty implementation. And this is what Dr. Graham will talk about. Um, and then it will enter into force 180 days after ratification of 44 states listed in the treaty. Now, those 44 states um, were identified uh, in 1996 as those states that were both members of the Conference of Disarmament, but were also listed by the IAEA as countries with either a nuclear um, research reactor or a nuclear power reactor on their territories, therefore be considered as nuclear capable. So those states are listed by name and required to ratify the treaty before the treaty can enter into force. Uh, so far, um, well, up to the date, eight of them remain. Um, and um, while five of them have signed the treaty, three have not yet done so. Uh, this has been the battle for the last 
24 years uh, to get the treaty in, in force. And uh, finally, um, the treaty is almost universal. If you compare it to other treaties that have been in, in force for a long time, it is actually uh, doing pretty well. Um, you can see obviously most notably the whole of Latin America and the Caribbean uh, have signed and ratified this treaty uh, and it's, very, it's a very, very powerful force in uh, the organization and in support of, of the treaty. Um, Africa is, is almost complete uh, as well, um, with the exception of a few small states and some states obviously like Somalia and South Sudan uh, for, for obvious reasons, but Egypt uh, is, a, is a problem. Um, it's this, the uh, Southeast Asia region also very much um, clear of, of, of states that have not yet signed or ratified. Uh, but the biggest problem lies um, in um, Asia and the Pacific. And so those are the countries that still need to, to ratify. So I am going to stop there.